nation's favourite antiques experts. That's me. I like that. Behind the wheel of a classic car. Hold on. <laughs> and a goal to scar Britain for antiques. <laughs> on guard. The aim to make the biggest profit at auction. But it's no mean feat. I can't believe it. There'll be worthy winners <laughs> yes. and valiant losers. Okay, I was robbed. Will it be the high road to glory? Right, come on, let's go. Or the slow road to disaster? Oh, road. Ah! Oh, road. This is the Antiques Road Trip. What fun. It's a brand new day, and our pair of antiques dealers, Tim Medhurst <laughs> and Rita Marriott, are enjoying all that the Cambridgeshire countryside has to offer. What did you have for breakfast? Oh, Ponzi Wonky. <laughs> is that you? Oh, you stink. <laughs> are we in the Beano? <laughs> Our Bash Street kids set out from Newark on Trent and are touring the Eastern Counties, the West Country and the South Coast before a final reckoning at Stamford. Plenty more countryside to enjoy. Look at that. Do you want to know a secret? Go on. I love tractors. I'm a <laughs> big, big tractor fan. <laughs> you painting a really good picture well, of I'm a really big there. fan of coinage and tractors. <laughs> Oh, there's a giant tractor. Ooh, oh, look at that's a big boy. <laughs> Do you love it, Tim? That's a Do big boy tractor, that it? is. That is huge. Yeah, sure is. Tractor-loving Tim won the auction last time, growing his initial £200 to a new total of £271.90. But our newbie is still ahead of the game with an impressive £290.10p. I think you're going to learn today that being a newbie doesn't necessarily mean that you don't know what you're doing. Right from the beginning, I've been saying I need to watch out. <laughs> <laughs> he really does. Time to fire the starting gun and get them moving. When the things they buy this time go under the hammer, they'll be watching at Hanley Hall near Worcester. But first... Tim's dropped off a Rita in lovely St Ives, the one in Cambridgeshire. And she's beginning her treasure hunt at Hyperion Home and Antique Centre. They've been in business here since 1960, when some of the current vintage stock must have been the height of fashion. I like the look of this. Oh, my goodness. Look at the glorious colour of that. Just love that sky blue enamel. Mid century, 1950s. Now let's see whether he has some magic on the back of it. And yes, it has. It says Norway, sterling silver, and it has the magic letters of DA, which stand for Anderson. And his jewellery is so well known. Yeah, I like those. Let me see what the tag says. Scandinavian brooch and earring set, £70. What can dealer Reuben do for madam? Looking sharp. Now, I have seen this earring and brooch set and it is priced at £70. OK. Do you have any idea of what might be the best on it? Do that for 50 Thank you, that's a definite deal. Uh, but I'll keep on looking and see what else I can find. Fabulous, thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. That's all right. So, while she dallies a while amidst the treasures of Hyperion, let's catch up with Tim, who's made his way to Cambridge, 30 minutes to the southwest. And what riches! He has not one but two shops this morning, right next door to each other. First, time to get busy at The Hive, where Bill is supervising his fine store of antiques and collectibles, and Tim is quite spoiled for choice. What fun! So many knickknacks in this shop. Look at that. It's a Georgian silver. Yep, silver hallmarked on the back. Silver shoe buckle. Now, that is a snapshot of social history, isn't it? You can imagine the Georgian dandy strolling down the cobbled street with a pair of Georgian silver buckles on his shoes. And this one's a particularly nice one. I like the circular shape and the bright cut decoration all the way around. And in the middle, the blued cut steel buckle itself. And there are collectors for shoe buckles. There's collectors for everything. And the price is £22. Now, I think I'll put that in my pocket for later. <gasps> Guess what I've just seen? Another one. 
but this time it's a rectangular one and it's hallmarked as well and it's got a maker's mark. Probably looks a similar period around 1770, 1790. So together they're priced at 47 pounds. I think they'd make a nice pair to put into an auction together. I'll put that in my pocket as well. Hey, don't forget to pay. Right, any more for any more? Ooh. Now what's this? That is my cup of tea. What we've got here, it says it on it, Wesley. This is John Wesley. He was the famous 18th century evangelist, theologian, and also the founder of the Methodist Church in the 18th century. Um, it's sort of known as a cameo plaque because the actual portrait itself stands out from the green background. Um, and this type of porcelain is sort of, it's sort of known as Jasperware, made famous by Josiah Wedgwood and the Wedgwood factory back in the 18th century. And um, it's attached inside a frame. So I'd like to get in there and have a look because when you look at things in frames, you've always got to check that the edges aren't damaged or there's restoration that is unseen from the front. Um, also, is it a 19th century one? I think it is, but we better check. Bill, Bill, have you got a screwdriver handy? I wouldn't give him one. Come on, what won't you undo? Yeah, I can't look. Tension. Right, it looks like a 19th century one to me and it's in lovely condition and it's priced at £38 with a frame. So I think that's definitely a go of the auction. Right, gather up these screws. Don't want to lose these. Now, to see what Bill can do. Right, Bill, I've had the back off and I love this plaque. Um, oh, also, in my pocket, I've got two rather nice Georgian buckles that I found as well. Um, now, combined, they come to 85. Yeah. Is there a bit of movement? You're a lovely chap, I can see that. The very best is going to be 70 for the three pieces. 70. Thank you, Bill. Um, I've had a whale of a time looking round, and I'm really pleased with these. There we are, the right money. Thanks very much. 40 for the buckles and 30 for the plaque. And there's still next door as well. But how's Rita getting on back in St Ives? What have we got here? So if you look at that, what do you think that might be? It looks like some sort of a presentation key, doesn't it? But in fact, it is a key that you would use to open your carriage door. So let's say you got a horse-drawn carriage and your butler is wanting to open it for you. You pop your key in, twist it, open the door, I think this dates to around 1880, 1900. The, the detail is amazing. The cartouches on both sides are blank. There's no hallmarks. It is silver plated, but it is just a cool thing to have. I really like that. One for Reuben. Reuben. Here we go. Can I show you this, please? Yeah, of course. So I have seen this um, pretty useless thing, a carriage key. Do you know how much it could be, please? 25, how's that sound? I'll give it a go for that money. Great. Thank you. Right, so I owe you 25 for this and 50 for the enamel set. So yep. let me give you some money, money, money. It's the best part. 20, 40, 60, 80. Thank you very much. Don't forget your change. Ta-ta for now. In Cambridge, Tim's knit next door to Cam's Antique Centre, where Janet is ready to serve. And what will it be amidst this eclectic array of antique and vintage? God, now that's wacky, isn't it? Oh, talking wacky, what a seat. Ooh, look at this. He's quite a big one. Oh. Oh. <laughs> oh. oh, dear. Where's his lung gone? His lung's fallen out. So we see. <laughs> <laughs> Got it. Thank goodness he never took up medicine. Oh. <laughs> now. Oh. So this looks like a school or student's anatomical figure. So you would be able to learn about all the bits and pieces inside. Um, it looks like it's got some age. It certainly had some use anyway. There's lots of wear to the surface. Um, I wonder how old that is. It looks like it might be... Oh. He keeps throwing his lungs at me. I mean, it looks like, to me, it could be a 1970s one. Um, look, there he is there. Little face. I love traditional antiques and I love quality, but sometimes you've got to go for something that's got the look. Janet, 
It's time for the procedure. Now, don't be afraid. Janet. Hello. Now, how can the anatomical figure not catch my eye? Right. Um, you've got 68 on it. OK. Do you think there's some movement there for me? Um, 55? 55. OK, it's an unknown to me, so I'm taking a punt. Can we get to 50? Is that possible? Go on then. Is that all right? Yeah, Nothing. yeah. That's okay. Fine. I want you to be happy. So yeah, yeah. Fifty pounds. Yeah, that's fantastic. Thank you very much. <laughs> now it's a bit of a handful, so I'll pop your money down there. Twenty, forty, fifty. Okay. Thank and you. See if I can um, keep them together. Yes, let's hope so. <laughs> and, uh, thank you very much, Janet. Okay. Thank Hopefully you. Hopefully, I'll keep myself together as well. Yeah. Rest assured, your progress will be closely monitored. Now, be respectful. Buckle you up. Don't want your bits falling out. Crikey. <laughs> Arita is travelling southwest now across the fine agricultural fields of Bedfordshire, where they're bringing in the harvest with the aid of 21st century farm machinery. And it's a pioneer of these iron workhorses she's off to learn about at the Shuttleworth Collection near Biggleswade. Ray Miller is the biographer of the father of the modern tractor, local inventor Dan Albone, who, years before he invented his tractor, showed an early aptitude for engineering. At age 13, no less, he actually made his own bicycle. Oh, really? That's it early? Yeah. A little similar to this uh, penny farthing. A keen cyclist and racer, Dan founded his own business in 1880, the Ival Cycle Works. By 1887, Dan's works employed 50 men, building 30 cycles a week. And controversially, not just bikes for men. Oh, no. In 1886, Dan Albone invented the first practical ladies' bicycle. Oh. The essence of that invention was that we had a dropped tube frame. And this is the same design as essentially we would regard as a ladies' Dutch bike of today, yes. for example. It, I no, mean, nothing it was looks... fundamentally altered. No, nothing looks any different. Yeah. Any chance you would like to take the gentleman's bike for a spin and I could get the ladies' one? I'd be delighted to have a spin with you on a bicycle, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Come on, then. Let's go. These bikes are more than 130 years old. This bike is amazing! Quite a spin. <laughs> Come on, Ray! Keep going! By the turn of the 20th century, Dan had progressed from bikes to motor manufacture and was on the brink of his biggest success. He progressed to make motor cars, motorcycles, and in 1902, he produced the first practical farm tractor. It was powered by a two-cylinder petrol engine and it could do more work than a team of four horses pulling a plough. So it was actually very productive in what it could do on the farm. Dan's machine was small and reliable and could do the work of heavy horses and labourers more speedily and cheaply. It mechanised ploughing, harrowing, hauling and harvesting, revolutionising the farming industry. Even with a steep price tag of £300, the orders rolled in. The tractor sold very well, um, both here and overseas. With... So it wasn't just sold in England, it was shipped around the world. Indeed, yes. Because it was the first practical farm tractor, it took off. It really did. There are still two in Britain, and here's one now. Look at him sat all gloriously up there. Driven by Dan Albone's great, great nephew, Alex Albone. That is what I call an entrance. That was pretty spectacular. It's beautiful, isn't it? I know, absolutely glorious. How did this become your possession? A group of us took it 100 miles on its 100th birthday to raise £100,000 for hospices. And when I had that chance of driving it, that was sort of 10 or 15 miles. I said to myself, one day I'll own this. And last year it came up for sale and I bought it. Now, what did you pay for it? Uh, an extraordinary amount of money, um, but I don't regret one penny of it. I just can't get over that something that was made 118 years ago is still functioning. There are seven in the world. There are two in Australia. There's one in Zimbabwe. 
there's one in Sweden, one in the Science Museum, and, and of course I've got one. And I bet you feel very, very proud. Oh, it's not going anywhere out of my family for a while, I can tell so you. So I can't buy it from you, can I? Absolutely not. No, it's not for sale. <laughs> well, if I can't buy it from you, is there a chance that I can try riding it? But of course, yes, we'll get it started and you can have a go. Fantastic. Lucky Irita. <laughs> I want a shot! See that handle there? OK. Just release it, push it forward. Back in the Reliant Scimitar, Tim's taking stock. Well, I've branched out to the wacky and ridiculous and I've bought um, this little guy. I'm gonna call you Dude. I've gone way out of my comfort zone. But he's wacky. I reckon he'll make a bit of money. Um, you're meant to look at me when I'm talking to you. Why would he, after you dropped his lungs? And worse. <laughs> Anyway, all their body parts are still on the move, heading northwest near Bedford, where inside Willington Garden and Leisure, Rob trades antiques under the name Time After Time. Garden centre and antique centre, the best two things. Couldn't agree more. OK, here we go. Charles locks on. You sit tight there, dude. Wish me luck. I think he's going a bit weird, dude, don't you? This is a huge place, housing all manner of antiques and vintage, so Tim should have no trouble finding something more, well, antique to spend some of the £151.90 he has left, hopefully. All kinds of weird and wonderful. What's that? It's interesting. Uh, oh, there's the other half. Oh, now I like this. You can see that it's glass beadwork and then inside is a wood and it looks like olive wood to me. Now, my thoughts immediately go to Turkey, lots of olive trees in Turkey. And the reason for that is, during the First World War, there was prisoner of war camps over in Turkey, um, where they held all sorts of prisoners. So this, I think, is a bit of prisoner of war work from around 1914, 1918, the First World War period. And I think that's absolutely charming. Look at that, so nicely made, all woven with little glass beads. I wonder how much, there's no prices. Look at that, all items in tray, one pound each. Well, got a pound in my pocket. Just gonna buy it. Yep, snap it up. Rob, how are you doing? Fine, thanks, Tim. Good. Well, I've um, been rummaging in your pound box and found a see. box for a pound. Jolly good. What do you think? I think it's quite attractive. Well, now, you tell me what it is. It's a little prisoner of war work box. Early oh. 20th century. First Very World attractive, War. yeah. Yeah, so I owe you a pound, Rob. Just leave it on the counter. Thanks very much. I hope I haven't robbed you. Well, I hope you make money with it. See you again. <laughs> Take care. <laughs> well, that adds a whole new dimension to the concept of the pound shop. Right, dude. Let's get on the road. Oh, can't wait to show you what I've bought. Organ recital tonight, anyone? Nighty night. And where are we off to this morning? So we are Nottinghamshire. Yeah. No. Between Nottinghamshire and Bedford. No, we're not. Northamptonshire. So we're between Nottinghamshire and Bedford. We're between... Northamptonshire. Northamptonshire. And Bedford. And Bedford. Right. Have you got it? Try got again. It. We're between Northamptonshire and Bedford. Yay! Five down, lucky. So where are we? <laughs> <laughs> We'll see soon enough. Tim has £150.90 left after snapping up a pair of buckles, a plaque, an anatomical model and a beaded box for pennies. Got a pound in my pocket. I'm just going to buy it. Rita bought a carriage, key and a brooch and earrings. So she still has £215.10 in her piggy. Do you know what? That would go really well with your it outfit. Would, today. wouldn't it today? Yeah. Do you think it would go well with my outfit? What do you think? <laughs> I couldn't possibly comment. <laughs> After dumping Tim, Arita will have the car all to herself as she makes her way to the town of Northampton. 
old cobblers, did I hear you say? Yes, indeed. 200 years ago, one in three adult men here were shoemakers. And Click Antiques and Vintage is this morning's first destination for Rarita and her finely cobbled boots. And this large warehouse is stuffed with interesting things, so she should have no trouble unearthing something marvellous. That is really unusual. So what have we got? We've got a piece of train, which is a piece of carved wood in the shape of a champagne bottle. And it says, Franco-British Exhibition, London 1908. What does it do? Oh, look at that magic! It turns into a pipe. How cool is that? You can actually see how it's been used over the years. And in fact, you can see teeth marks all the way around there. Right, what's the damage on this one? 30 pounds. It's got to be a goer for that. Time to speak to owner Claire. Claire, could I have a chat, please? Hello. Hi, Claire. I've spotted this. Lovely. It's priced at 30 pounds. Okay. You... Oof, don't... Was that a good? Oof, okay. Uh, we could do 24. So, 24 pounds? Yeah, 24 yeah. is fine. OK, fantastic. I'll have that for 24. Brilliant. And um, let me carry on looking and see what else I can find. Move your way. Thank you. Leave no stone unturned. Now, this ticks my boxes. That is just stunning quality. Oh, my gosh, it's so sweet! <gasps> It is all solid silver with original glass eyes. The detail is fantastic. And yes, it has got nicks and patina and wear to it. And wouldn't you if you were 100? I'm sure I would. So I'm just going to have a little peek. Just want to see whether there is any holes. And there isn't. Absolutely not a single one. This will be dating from 1900s. In fact, it's Hallmark 1903. And look how nice that is. It's a big price tag, £125. Over to Claire. Claire? Hi. I have spotted this very nice brolly. I just wish it would have been a stick. I can't do much about that. But what you could do is you could tell me what is the absolute death. 80. Oh. That's some poker face 80. at 80. Well, at 80, that is a definite yes. So let me give you some cash. So what do I do? 80 and 24 for the pipe. So that's 104. 104. Here we go. Thank you very much. No, thank you very much. Good luck. See you later. Off you go. Mary Poppins. Whack, whack. <laughs> Time to catch up with Tim, who's travelling east into neighbouring Bedfordshire to Cardington, which has a special place in the history of early aviation. These giant sheds that dominate the landscape are a century-old legacy of Britain's airships. Tim's meeting Lydia Saul from Bedford's Higgins Museum. Lydia, lovely to meet you. That is an impressive building. Can we have a look inside? Can we do that? Yeah, that's good. Love to see it. Thank you. You lead the way. This story starts during the First World War and the advent of aerial warfare. Ike Moses. Lydia, this place is ginormous. I mean, it's not just big, is it? But what were they used for, these hangars? The Germans had started building their own Zeppelins and they started bombing London and surrounding areas. And so the Admiralty decided they were going to have to start an initiative of their own. So Shorts Brothers were commissioned to come to Bedford and to set up their own airship works here. So why were these hangars built in Bedford? Why was Bedford the choice? It was actually further than they believed the Zeppelins could reach when they were coming over from Germany. So it made it a safe place to start building the airships to combat those. And also it had quite a good pool of semi-skilled labour from the other engineering works in the local area. 
but also um, they actually had a really good pool of women workforce here who ended up making the gas bags from 100,000 oxen intestines Ooh. because that was the only material that would be airtight enough to contain the hydrogen gas. The first of the airships was R31, but sadly it only was completed five days before the end of the oh. First World War because it took them that long to build yeah. sheds. So the sheds weren't built until sort of October 1916 and then were finished in spring 1917 and then they had to build the ship. After the armistice, the airship site was nationalised and a new era of aviation was ushered in. It was the 1920s that saw a very much a new type of airship that dream come about. And that was for passenger flight because they could be so much quicker than the traditional sailing ships. For example, it would literally take 16 weeks to get all the way to India, whereas with these airships, they could take five or six days. I mean, that's amazing, yeah. isn't it? In 1923, the Air Ministry commissioned the building of two enormous civilian craft, which would link Britain with its global empire, one to be built by a private company and the other here at Cardington. It was a competition and a race to complete these rigid aircraft, built to resemble luxury liners with their big window promenades, elegant lounges and dining rooms decked out in high-class fittings. Nothing on this grand scale had ever taken to the skies before. R100 was first to fly the Atlantic in July 1930. The R100 did fly to Canada in the space of um, sort of 10, 10 days. Wow. So, and so there was a real pressure on for the R101 to, to have just as glorious a maiden yeah. flight as the R100. Three times the length of a modern jumbo jet, this lighter-than-air giant set off for Karachi on the 4th of October 1930 on a voyage intended to display the success and viability of the airship programme. But the dream died as R101 crashed near Paris and exploded into an inferno in which 48 of the 54 people on board perished. Hybrid Air Vehicles in Bedford is one company redeveloping the technology, hoping to make airships the commercially viable luxury travel of the future. CEO Tom Grundy is a man with a vision. Airlander is almost as efficient in the air as an airship, but it's actually it's a heavier-than-air aeroplane. It takes off and lands on the ground. You know, we're the future of something that's got a long history, but we're bringing new technology to play to make all of that work. Unlike those earlier airships, it looks like a classy way to travel. It's like going back 100 years ago. It's the same idea, but a lot more advanced, isn't it? The technology that we're bringing to bear to make this work is really different to the technology back from uh, 100 years ago, of course. But the overriding requirement to do things in a better way for the planet, well, that's very much a problem with us now and a solution that we can bring with Airlander. It's a very exciting future. It is. And fantastic that the intertwined story of airships and this corner of Bedfordshire continues. Back on Earth, <laughs> and Eritas moving on to their last shop of the day, hoping to get there before the aviator. If I would have to describe Tim in three words, it would be nerd, geek, and a cheapskate. Charming. <laughs> she just wishes she'd got something for a pound. She's on her way in a southwesterly direction now to Haversham, near Milton Keynes, where they'll both be shopping in a shed not quite the size of those at Cardington, but pretty big. This is G Dad's Collectibles, and that's owner Mark at the ready. Arita's got first dibs on everything here, so crack on, girl. These are typical of Oriental silverware, two junks. These have absolutely no marks at all. However, how do you tell whether it's silver or silver plates? The easiest thing to do is give it a bit of a bend, just bends easily, when silver plates won't do that. It'll be very hard and rigid. 32 pounds for the pair. Yes, they're cheap. Yes, they're probably silver. But the quality is in there. So I'm going to leave those and I'm going to keep on looking and I will find what I'm looking for. 
I don't doubt it. Aha! Here's Marathon Man now. You haven't got far. Coins, coins, coins. That is the sort of antique centre I like. You walk in the door and the first cabinet you come to is full of coins. Love it. Now, let me tell you about this one. Look at the size of that. That is a two pence coin from 1797. And on there we've got the powerful, almost Roman-like portrait of George III facing right. And then on the back, you've got Britannia seated with her shield and trident and the date 1797. Size-wise, it's actually bigger than the biggest silver coin that was in circulation, the crown, five shillings. And this was only two pence. The price here, £25. I don't think that's badly priced. I mean, that's got to be worth £30, £40. So I'll pop that there, see if there's anything else. Maybe I can do a little mix lot of coins. We'll see what else there is. Knock yourself out, numismatist. <laughs> How's Arita getting on? This instantly grabs me and it feels so nice. All the raised decoration that has been enamelled on top of the porcelain. Wonder, has a guy any cracks? Nah. Can you hear that? Nice little ping to it. There's no cracks, no chips. It's one of those things that is immensely hard to date. Even the experts don't always know how old it actually is. Similar work was produced during the 18th century reign of the Qianlong Emperor. Original sell for millions, but Victorian reproductions can also be worth quite a bit. It is £85. I think this should be my last buy of this leg. I know it's a gamble, but hey-ho, go larger, go home. Quite. Mark is nearby. Mark? Yes, hello. Hello, how Hi. are you? I'm fine, thank you. <laughs> I have seen this vase and it is priced at £85. OK. And I was wondering what would be the absolute rock bottom. OK, if I was to go to £70. Well, it is a gamble at 50, 60, 70 or 80. So I will take that gamble at 70, please. Oh, brilliant, thank you. Thank you. Right, that is for you. And this is for me. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Done and dusted. Now, is our excitable coin man still cooing over that cabinet? Oh, that's nice. I saw a glint of silver. And there you have an early 19th century Georgian half-crown. The same monarch, King George III, he died in 1820. And this portrait was engraved by a very famous engraver, called Benedito Pastrusi, and he was the head engraver for the Royal Mint and produced some of the most amazing designs, even designs that are still used today. I think this one's a winner. It's priced at only £12. So the two coins together, the cartwheel Tupney bit, £25. This £12, £37 for the two. If I can negotiate on those, put them together as a mixed lot, we might do all right. So let's see. Mark? Yes, hi, Hello, Tim. Mark. Hi. I've just found a couple of coins here that I quite like. OK. They come to the to total of uh, £37. What I was thinking was, Mark, if you could do the two for 30, would that be all right? Yes, I think we can. Is that but fair? That's not... OK. Great. That's Brilliant. fine. Thank you. Yes, I'm right, I'm going to tuck the money there under the doggy's paw. Thank you very much. OK. Take care. Thank you. Bye. Hurrah! Pile into that car. I'll be off with you. A bit nippy. It is very nippy. My feet are numb. Have you got my hot water bottle? Keep yourself yes. warm. <laughs> it's leaked. I've got a wet patch on my leg now. <laughs> I look like I've had an accident. <laughs> Change of trousers for tomorrow, then. Nighty night. Well, this is absolutely beautiful. Absolutely stunning. So it is. They've made their way to the lovely barns and yard at Hanley Hall, not far from Worcester, this morning to watch on their tablets as their antique purchases go under the hammer. I am very much worried about this auction. How do you feel? I'm not going to lie, I am as well. Deep <laughs> breaths, nervous ones. Door and Reese in Frome is where this sale is taking place. The goods are stacked high, and bidding will be taking place online, by phone and on the book. Arita spent £249 on five lots. 
What does auctioneer Guy Taylor fancy as a winner? We have the silver-handled, duck-decorated ladies' parasol. Lovely design to the handle there, right down to the glass eyes. Really nice piece. We would expect that one to make between 80 and 140. Tim parted with £151 on his five lots. Lovely. The uh, Georgian uh, silver half crown and the penny as well. Two nice Georgian coins. Very little wear to the silver coin, which is unusual. Uh, we would estimate that that will make between 50 and 80 pounds. Look at this. I am so excited. Are I you? literally cannot wait. And I Are cannot... you nervous? <sighs> Let me count to five and then ask me again. Very. That was not five. <laughs> <laughs> he felt like 15. I... That's how nervous I am. Right, right here we come go. Come on then, let's see what he does. Bargain central first. Can Tim get a result with the one pound beaded box? I have absolutely no doubt it will do well. I hope so. Well, it's got to make more than a pound, doesn't it? 12 I have, 14, 16, 18, Whoa. 20, 30. How many people have it? 36, 40, 42, 44, 50. 52 now. It's going to be sold to my right at 50 pounds. A pound. Done at 5 0. Tim, I have to hand it to you. Great start. How do you do the, it? It was a stroke of luck, that one. No pressure, Arita. Her carriage key is next. It's something I'd never seen before. The fact that I bought something you had never seen, that alone is worth it. At 22, 25, 30, 35. 40. See, 42, quality sells. 50 now. All done at 48. It's a good start, too. Almost double your money. I am very, very, very happy with that. Watch the lungs. Tim's anatomical model is up now. Quite often you find them there about this big. Mm. This is almost life. And all, and all the parts come out, don't yeah. they? Yeah. So well, they were falling out. It's not... <laughs> uh, 20, I'm away on that one. Oh, 22 no. now, if you want. Well, it's a start. 22, 24, 36, oh. 38, 40, 42. Oh, come on. 44 now. Don't stop. Come on. Place. One more, one more. It's going to be sold on the oh, side. No. At 46. Oh, dear. Organ failure. He was a laugh, wasn't he? He wasn't as good a laugh as I am, but, you know... <laughs> Under the hammer next is Arita's expensive Chinese vase. In all honesty, I think it's the sort of thing a couple of people could get into and it could make good money. Would you get into it? No. <laughs> 38, I'm bid. 40 now. Come on. 40 I have. 42, oh, he's got some bids in the room. 48. Go, go, 50, go. 60, I have. 70. Yes. 72. <gasps> 75. 78. 80. <gasps> It's being I know! At Don't go! Pounds. All done at 80. It was a gamble, and it's not a loss. I will take that. It was worth the gamble, because if you haven't lost anything. No! No! And I, you made a tenner. Yes! One for the numismatists now. It's Tim's coins. The Georgian half crown on its own. Mm. That should be worth 50 to 80 on its own. 45, I'm bid. 50 now. 55, 60, 65. 70, 80, yes. 90, 95, 100, 5, 10, 15, 120 now. Done at 115. He's in the money. That is so good. Oh, so relieved that coins made coins. <laughs> Time now for Arita's champagne bottle pipe combo. What's your predictions? <sighs> Fiver. What? I don't know. <laughs> Start me off ten pounds then. Come 10 on. Bid, Twelve. Twelve. 14, Sixteen. Eighteen. Twenty. Twenty-two. Twenty-four. I bid. Twenty-six. Oh. Twenty-eight. Oh. 30, Got me out of trouble now. there. Got a little flurry. All done. At three o. Cheers. Every little helps. At least all my money didn't go up in smoke. <laughs> I see what you did there. <laughs> Can Tim's plaque of Wesley give cause for thanks? To be fair, the frame alone is worth thirty pounds. Yeah. Thank you for talking it up. Yeah. <laughs> Start me off ten pounds then. No. no. Ten I bid. Twelve now if you want it. Oh, don't be silly. So much more than 14, that. Sixteen, eighteen, twenty. Two people. Two now. Twenty-six. Twenty-eight. 
30. Keep going. 32. Keep going. 34 now. Oh, don't, it's gonna don't be stop. Right no. Pounds. That's so cheap. 32. Hmm. No songs of praise there. Oh. Oh, Tim, I'm gutted. That's painful. <sighs> Maybe Irita's David Anderson jewellery will boost her fortunes. Nice to have the brooch and earrings. Well. Yes, yeah. She's got everything going for it. 50 I have, oh. 52. Home and dry. 58, 60. Oh, anything, look at this. Anything else is a benefit. 70, 75, 78, 85, 88. 90 now, it's being sold at 88. All done. A goodly result. Well done. I ain't complaining. <laughs> I made a profit. <laughs> Tim's last lot now, the Georgian silver shoe buckles. I reckon if you lived in Georgian times, you would have worn these. Do you think? <laughs> 40, 42, Go. 45, 48. Told you you were safe. 50, yes. 52, 55. Keep them going. 58, 60, 62. That's good. 68. That's an amazing price. Pounds. Yes. All done. Tim's tally is looking healthy. Are you a happy bunny now? I'm a happy bunny. <laughs> Arita is a bit behind, but her Edwardian parasol is the last lot to auction now. I have to admit, I don't think you were quackers buying it because I would have bought that. Dad jokes again. <laughs> quackers buying it. <laughs> 55 on the way on that one. 60 now. Oh, I've got some way to bid. go. 65, 70. Five, that's a good sign. He's taking 80, bids from somebody in the clouds up there. 90, 95, 100. <laughs> Five, <laughs> ten, fifteen. Keep going. Twenty, twenty-five, thirty. Right, I'm going. <laughs> forty, forty-five. That's an amazing one, price. Fifty-five, and sixty. I can't believe it. Sixty-five. What was this? And seventy, and seventy-five. No. One eighty, one eighty-five. You've done it. You've done it. You've made it big. One ninety fresh place. What? Ninety-five, two hundred. 10, no way! Now. The bid's 210. <laughs> oh, all done. At 210, all done. She's smashed it. 210 pounds. Wowzers. Well, I'm going to take it like water off the duck's back. Good one. I like that. <laughs> Despite the dude making him a loss, Tim still earned enough after auction costs to top up his piggy to quite an impressive £375.92p. Well done. But Irita sailed away, Mary Poppins style, with that brolly and soars ahead after sale room fees with a fine total of £415.02p. I can't wait to go and spend every penny. Well, you got more than I you got started in my kitty. With. Come on. Come on.